All right, I guess I'll start the reading here. Journeying, 1924, Lord Mayher. Many were at the station as Laxar is a major junction for people on pilgrimage to Hardwar. Bajif Dar arrived at 4 a.m. the following morning with the latest news about matters in Bombay. Baba explained to him about the proposed foot journey to Sukhori. Baba asked the four men whether they should proceed to Sukhori by foot, searching for sadhus and saints on the way, or journey by train to different places of pilgrimage and eventually return to Maribad. Staji, Ramji, and Padri were eager to put an immediate end to the foot journey and continue touring by train. Unexpectedly, Baba also agreed to stop walking. With Bajiftar, they took a train from Laksar at 1.30 p.m. and reached Moradabad at 6 that evening. Arriving in Moradabad, Baba immediately set out in search of sadhus and found one in a temple near the river. The holy man must have been genuine because not only did Baba bow to him, but the Madali did so as well. For the men to bow down was an unusual occurrence, and the sadhu applied ash to each man's forehead, including Baba's. While returning, Baba spotted a must seated in filth near a neem tree. It was learned that this God intoxicated man had been sitting in that spot for four years and had never moved despite all types of weather conditions. He would excrete where he was sitting into his hand and throw the feces over his shoulder, wiping his hands on his straw mat. After discovering that the, mat, the must was extremely fond of kulfi or ice cream, Baba fed him a large amount. Baba paid a nearby restaurant owner five rupees to feed the must kulfi whenever he wished more. Baba with his companions slept on the railway platform and departed for Bhopal the following day. Tuesday, 19th of August, Baba's health continued to be poor. He had many motions and vomited also. They, trained, they changed trains at Lucknow, but Padre stayed in the train and continued to Benares to meet Sadashiv. He was directed to proceed with him to Baroda where all would meet. Baba arrived in Bhopal on the afternoon of the 20th of August, and there too, he continued to search out and bow to sadhus. Adi arrived from Abhinagar the next day and pleaded with Baba to end his wandering and come back to Maravad. Baba did not give him a definite answer and left in the evening for Ratlam, allowing Adi to accompany them. Maramji was sent ahead to Baroda to make the necessary arrangements on the arrangements. On the train, Baba's health had suffered alarmingly, so they decided to rest in Baroda for a couple of days until he regained his strength. They reached Ratlam on the morning of 22 August. For some hours, Baba walked about the city, contacting and bowing to sadhus, reaching Baroda at 8 p.m. in the evening. They rendezvoused rendezvous with Padre, Sadashiv, and Baramji. Baba then ordered Adi back to Ahmednagar. Baramji had arranged for their stay in the Gujarat Hindu Lodge, where Baba stated, after journeying to Mount Abu, our tour will end and we will return to Maribad and settle there. The men were glad to hear this since they were exhausted after traveling continually for three weeks. One factor in Baba's decision, although unmentioned, was that their money was almost all spent. It was an unexpected change the next day. Although it was quite hot, Baba and the men casually went about sightseeing in Baroda. They visited the Maharaja's play, Palace and the Baroda Museum and Art Gallery and other tourist sites of the town. Afterward, Baba discussed a new plan with Sadashiv. We will settle in the Singhagad Fort area near Pune. Singhagad was an ideal place for the resident Madali to live. There we can lead a quiet, secluded life since it has a salubrious climate with plenty of water. And besides, it is in Babajan's territory. 
Instead of resting in Baroda as planned, Baba left two days later at 10 p.m. and arrived at Ujjain on 25th of August at 1 p.m. After lunch, he set out in search of more sadhus and found many on the banks of the Sikra River. There were several lepers as well. Baba bowed to the sadhus, placing his forehead on their feet and gave them money as his dakshina. A temple was located on the banks of the Sipra River, and Baba told Sada Shiv to ba bathe first in the river and then go to the temple and offer worship according to Hindu rites. Two strange sadhus were found in a hut next to the temple. One of them was a leper whose eyes were badly affected and whose fingers were almost completely wasted away. Baba approached them gently. He placed some coins on the ground before the sadhus. But when he bent over to place his head at their feet, the leprous sadhu withdrew his legs with a loud humph. Instead of touching his feet, Baba folded his hands and reverently bowed his head to the man, then quietly left. This leprous sadhu knew who had come to bow to him. Baba later indicated that the sadhu was spiritually advanced. Before they left the river site, the sadhu began singing melodiously and beating a, a rhythm on his thighs as if to convey his great joy of, at having had Baba's darshan. Leaving Ujjain at 4 p.m., they arrived in Mortaka at 10 p.m. on the 25th of August. They slept on the station platform and the next morning rode in a bullock cart Om Kareshwar, or Mandata, a famous place of pilgrimage for Hindus, 12 miles away. And we have a sidebar that says, Om Kash Kareshwar is where Opazi Maharaj had first developed breathing trouble from entering the initial stages of Samadhi, which led him to seek help from Narayan Maharaj and Sai Baba. Padri too was now suffering from dysentery and stayed behind in the town. Although Baba himself was still quite ill and feeling weak, he made the journey in the bullock cart, suffering its jolts. In Om Kareshwar, Baba met a Bengali pundit, a Brahmin scholar or priest named Nirmal Ananda Swami. The local people called him Mahatma taking him to be a holy man. While Baba talked with him in English, Sadashiv was instructed to take a bath in the sacred Narmada River. With the Swami's help, Baba found a number of other sadhus in the area to whom he could bow. They returned to Mortaka at 10 p.m. and immediately departed by train for Baroda. On the 27th of August, 1924, at a way station, an elderly Muslim wanted to board their compartment. It was sundown and Padre tried to stop him since Baba said he wished to be alone. But the man caught a glimpse of Baba and insisted on having a closer look. Pointing to Baba, he started shouting, why are you preventing me from meeting that gentleman? I only want to shake hands with him. Why do you stop me? He then got into the train and held out his hand to Baba who extended his. After clutching hands, the Muslim was quite happy and Baba spoke with him for a long time. During their conversation, the man took out a chunk of opium, folded it in a chapati and swallowed it. When Baba casually asked about the Pavagar Hills, the man praised the place vociferously and was humorous in his language and manner. The drug took effect and in an expansive mood, he continued to sing the praises of Pavagar. It's heaven, I tell you, a paradise on earth. And to the surprise of the Mandali, Baba appeared to take the man seriously and decided to go there instead of to Mount Abu. All right, can we have a next reader? Rosalie, would you like to go next? Thank you. At eight that evening, Baba Baramchi, Padre, and Gustachi arrived in Baroda and stayed once again in the Gujarat Hindu Lodge. Sadashiv remained on the train and returned directly to Pune. The next afternoon at 4 p.m., 
they walked to Pavagar and reached the foot of the mountain at nine that evening. <clears throat> they had to carry their baggage along the narrow jungle road. <clears throat> and Padre asked Gustaji to light a lantern to guide them, implying that Baba might trip and fall. <clears throat> but Gustaji insisted that the other travelers along the road were carrying lanterns and there was sufficient light and no need to waste kerosene. As they began to follow one man, he walked briskly ahead, leaving them stumbling in the dark. Padre fell down and injured his leg and later vented his anger at Gustaji. A Muslim police officer happened by and escorted them to a dharamshala where they rested for the night. As the place was situated in the middle of the jungle and was frequented by wild animals, the policemen strongly advised them to stay indoors and not venture out in the night. On 29th August, they awoke at 6 a.m and soon began climbing the steep mountain, whose summit was engulfed in a thick fog. Baba continued to suffer from dysentery and was passing a glutinous liquid. He had pains in his stomach, which only subsided a little whenever he stopped walking for a few minutes. Despite this condition, <clears throat> His pace up the formidable trail was the swiftest. They stopped twice along the way to have tea. In contrast to their climb through the Nilgiri's hills, excellent tea was available, but Baba had not allowed them to have any before they started. After climbing three miles, they reached the summit on which a Hindu temple had been dedicated to Kali. Thousands of people flocked there during the annual fair, but the daily number of pilgrims averaged only a few dozen. Baba and the Mandali went inside the Kali temple and bowed to the shrine of the Divine Mother. Beyond the temple was the Darga of a Muslim saint named Saijan Shah Wali. Baba again led the men inside and all bowed their heads on the saint's tomb. They sat for a while viewing the ruins of the fort and enjoying the beautiful scenery of the hills and valley. While relaxing, Baba again brought up the subject of reciting at Sinhagad near Pune and living in huts, which they would construct. The Mandali liked the idea more since the area seemed similar to Pavagar. They descended the mountain at noon. After lunch, they returned to Baroda at 8.15 p.m., spending the night in the Gujarat Lodge. The following day, the master again repeated his same enigmatic statement that he had done throughout the tour. I am not a Baba. Confronting the Mandali, he cried out, it is you who have bestowed babahood upon me. Now sadhus and saints want to crush me. By this time, Padri, Kustaji, and Baramji were fed up with hearing this baffling repetition and pleaded with Baba to cease such statements. In reply, Baba said, I am serious. I have no stuff in me. And my masters, Baba John and Maharaj, also have no stuff in them. 
Upasni Maharaj is not even a saint, let alone a sadguru. When one of the men asked why he uttered such strange statements about his masters, Baba explained, divine law compels me to say it. And divine law applies to you also. Whatever you do, you are obliged to do and according, you are obliged to do it according to divine law. Baba's remarks were mainly directed towards Padre, who was only 21 at the time. The reason Baba was constantly repeating this over and over again was that Padre's mind had become disturbed thinking, what type of spirituality is this? What type of... Good morning. You need to mute yourself. What type of... Annual exam. Who is unmuted? Uh, once again, Baba's remarks were mainly directed toward Padre, who was only 21 at the time. The reason Baba was constantly repeating this over and over again was that Padre's mind had become disturbed, thinking, what type of spirituality is this? What type of masters are these who behave toward one another in a way and in which even ordinary people would hesitate to act. When Padre had delivered the horse Sufi and the ox Sant to Pasni Maharaj at Sakori, Maharaj had not only abused and cursed him terribly, but he also refused to accept the animals. This was inexplicable when it had been clearly explained that they had been sent by Meher Baba. Padre thought, if Baba already knew what was going to happen, why did he send Nervous and me there in the first place? Why did Maharaj act so furiously? Along the tour, the questions disturbing Padre's mind were answered by Baba at different times without ever being voiced. Padre knew Baba's remarks were directed at him and felt ashamed for doubting the wisdom of the master's orders, though he found no way to understand their full meaning. Despite their attempts to control their minds, the men still became fed up with Baba for repeating the same theme again and again. He would do so morning, noon, and night until they could not tolerate hearing how saints and sadhus were out to destroy his babahood. It would not be a matter of him saying he was not a baba for a few minutes. The Mandali were made to listen to the same haranguing monologue for hours until they could stand it no longer and would plead with him to stop. At times, the master would curse them to arouse them out of their laxness. He also tried to create doubts in their minds by confronting them. What do you know? You only say I am God in human form. Do you really believe I am God? What have you gained from me? Have you gained anything? Tell me what you were thinking. Speak up. Thus the master hammered away at his close disciples until they were thoroughly fed up. Baba changed their route again. Instead of Sakori, he headed toward Bombay. Adi was telegraphed in Amanagar and instructed to meet them there with Masaji. After spending 10 days in the area on 9 September, 
The group left Baroda and arrived in Bombay. Baba and the men stayed with Kaikushru Masa and Bajifdar's families in Irani Mansion for a week. A permanent residence was still to be settled. After only a few days, Baba decided to visit Goa and the other places in South India with some of the Mandali. Padre was exhausted from their recent journey and entreated Baba to allow him to stay behind. Moreover, he was mentally fatigued from Baba's constant goading. He pleaded with Baba not to take him, but Baba, pinching his throat in the Indian gesture of a promise, said, come along, I swear I won't bother you anymore. Padre did not believe him. Padre, one of the youngest Mandali, was often caught between the quarrels of the older men, especially Gustaji and Baramji, who had been at loggerheads throughout the journey. This, along with Baba's constant teasing, had caused too much emotional turmoil for him to endure any longer. Padre himself had a short temper and feared that he might become so enraged that he would say something disrespectful for which he might have to repent for the rest of his life. <laughs> Despite Baba's promise, Padre did not go. Baba appointed Vajifdar manager in his place. On 14th September, 1924, Baba left Bombay for Pune with Gustaji, Baramji, Masaji, and Vajifdar. From Pune, they immediately departed from Panjim. During the train ride, Vajifdar fell ill with fever. And by the time they reached Landa, his condition had worsened. Thank you, Rosalie. Tina, would you read next? Thank you. Muted, Tina. Sorry. Uh, in Londa, on some pretext, Baba became angry with Vajiftar and ordered him to lie down on, the, on a bench on the station platform. Masaji was ordered to look after him while Bayramji was sent to bring fresh milk. Baba and Masaji, uh, 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 sorry. Baba and Gustaji ate in a Hindu restaurant and brought food back for Bayramji and Masaji. Vajiftar was given the milk and the journey resumed. Amazingly, by Baba's venting rage at him, Vajiftar's condition steadily improved and after a few hours, he was completely well. All their luggage, except for Baba's bedroll, was sprayed with a disinfectant at Castle Rock Station. Leaving the train at the spot at the port of oh my god these names Marmagao, they went to a they went by boat to Panjim, and reached there after an hour and a half. They stayed in a large hotel owned by the Christians at Panjim and in the town of Old Goa. They saw various Portuguese churches and other Christian landmarks. The most important church they visited was the Basilica of Bom, Good, Jesus, which contains the body of Francis Xavier, who is re revered as a saint. The in the mummified body of the Jesuit priest and missionary has been preserved since the 18th century 
and is still displayed to the public once every few years. Goa is one of the few areas of India that is predominantly Christian and this and this basilica is considered the most important place of Catholic pilgrimage in India. Baba made an extensive tour of the elaborate church, even climbing the dark spiral staircase discuss of the disused bell tower. Just Perhaps, the sidebar that we have. I don't for, see any sidebar. I got it. Uh, it's about Francis Xavier. Uh, he was a Catholic priest who helped found the Jesuits, called the Apostle to the Indies. He spent 11 years as missionary in Southeast Asia and Japan before settling in India. Okay. I don't know where those notes are. They don't come up on this screen. You see this, uh, this little mark right here? I have to, I have to <laughs> click on that? Yeah, you have to uh, click well, it. I, I don't know if it works if you click on it, but I click on it and it works. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it doesn't work when I click on it. Um, so where were we? Uh, perhaps Baba was able to complete his work early because after staying in Goa for only three days, he decided to return to Bombay. In Bombay, he stayed at the Irani mansion in Dardar. What's the Irani mansion? Does anyone know? I think it's the of a, of, a, of a home, of a building. You know, they, they give names to a lot of buildings there in India. Yeah. During the succeeding three months of September, October, and November 1924, Baba was mostly at Maribad, but he traveled back and forth between Bombay and Ahmednagar several times uh, with one or two of the Mandali. The purpose of his frequent trips was to establish a permanent place of resi residence for himself in the Mandali, the plan to settle in Sinhagad had been abandoned. The, ma the master began regularly visiting the family of Nusawan Satha at their large joint family residence come business complex in Ahmednagar called Akbar Press, which housed a cotton mill and later a printing press when Baba was staying at Maribad, his mail would be addressed to Akbar Press and Nusawan would forward it by messenger to Maribad. Keep going. Sometimes Baba would go to the Satha home and eat lunch and relax sitting under a shady tree in the compound, discussing matters with his Mandali and Nusawan. Nusawan had a stepbrother, Ardashir, four brothers, Meherji, Jemi, Homi, and Pilu, and four sisters, Banumasi, Karawala, Gaimai, Jesawala, <laughs> oh my God, Gula, Satha, and Shireen, Damania. Gradually, by- Let's read the footnote here. The brothers were known by all as Meherji, Mama, Jemmy Mama, Homi Mama, and Pilu Mama. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, and where was, gradually by his frequent visits, all the family members of this Parsi family were deeply drawn to him and accepted Meher Baba as their spiritual master. In the years that followed, his spiritual connection with the Sasa Satha and Jesawala families became very significant. Also during this period, new contacts were established in Ahmednagar and Bombay and these newcomers were to prove useful to, in the master's work in the near future. Gangaram Parwar, <laughs> who served Baba's bhakti when he first visited Arangam in 1923, became closely connected with the master at this time. Gangaram was a carpenter and he would now spend his days at Maribad doing repairs. 
a Christian, Parwar would occasionally read the Bible in Marathi to Baba because he was older than the other residents. He was nicknamed Ajoba, means grandfather. Footnote, Ajoba later kept a diary of activities at Maribai. Go ahead. Okay. Maruti P Patil, the headman of the village, also became closely associated with Baba because these two men, uh, because of these two men, all the villagers in Arangaon came to know of Meher Baba. One of the connection, the uh, one old connection outwardly severed at the time was with Homi Vajiftar, the cricketer. One of Vajiftar's close friends had passed away, but before the man died, Vajiftar had promised to look after his widow. Baba advised Vajiftar to join his mandali, but Vajiftar felt obligated to honor his promise to his friend. Baba then told him not to go his own way. It would be seven long years before Vajiftar saw Baba again. Mara and her mother, Daulat Mai, were staying with Rustam and Fraini at Kushru quarters in Avanagar. Small Korshid too was staying with them. At times, Baba would call them into Marabad to see him. Baba instructed the women to meditate and to write the Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian name of God, Yezdan, over and over again for a half an hour uh, each day. They were then to cut paper into small pieces and roll each piece bearing the name Yezdan into a tiny roll and save them all. He Later, he added that the small scrolls would eventually become immersed in the sea. In addition, Baba assigned the women the work of stitching clothes for the children and poor of um, Arangaon. All right, thank you, Tina. Let's have another reader. Mahu, could you go next? Thank you. Okay. Page 558, journey in year 1924. One day at Merabad, he asked, how many ships have you sewn? They replied that they had made about 50. Is that all? He inquired, can't you do the work more quickly? By now you should have sewn at least 200. They accepted this challenge and returned to Ahmad Nagar. After some time, Baba permitted Mehra, Dolad Mai, and a small Khurshid to move to Merabal, and they were accommodated in the post office. Daula, Masi, Naja, and Big Khurshid joined them from Pune. Thus, these six women became the first women to stay permanently at Mehraba. The shirts they had stitched so lovingly were distributed by Baba to the poor of Aranga. Once Baba called Mehra and told her, from today you are my orderly. Ustaji was instructed to give Baba's trunk to her in which all of his personal belongings were kept. Mehera was told to prepare and send Baba's tea, wash his clothes, and clean his plate and glass daily. Sidebar says, Mehera personally attended to Baba until the last, and he did not assign this special duty to any other of the women Madhuri. Baba would come to the ladies' veranda early in the morning. He would call out to Naja, Hey, Najru, it's past six. Time to awaken. Naja would hurry out of bed and Baba sitting on an empty 
tea crate would melodiously sing, I will always be the handmaid of my master. Singing this one, singing this one line, Baba would sometimes dance a few steps, like Krishna with his gopis, which is women mandalis. At other times when he would sing Tukaram's bhajans, he would appear extraordinarily happy and radiant. However, when his mood would be spoiled by one of the ladies' carelessness, his words were as if thunderbolts were crashing and the heavens were about to fall. Such moments would leave the women, women awestruck. During one occasion, Baba asked Mehera if she knew a song in English, and if so, to sing it. Mehera sang the song Swani, composed by George Gershwin, and Baba asked her to teach it to him. After Mehera repeated it, Baba sang the American tune quite beautifully. Sidebar says, Swani, how I, is the words to the song. Swani, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swani. I would give the world to be among the folks in Dixie, even though my mammy's waiting for me, praying for me down by the Swani. The folks up north will see me no more when I get to that Swani shore. Mm -hmm. On Monday, 17 November 24th, 1924, Baba retired to his Jukti at Mehrabad at 6.15 p.m. and began observing silence for one week. He remained secluded in the Jukti with the door shut, while Pad Padre kept watch on the veranda day and night. Occasionally, Baba would eat at times on alternate days, taking tea four times a day on the days he did not eat. But Padre had instructions to keep his eyes down and not look at his face while bringing his meal. Gustaji and Masaji were the only other men who were with Baba at this time. Most of the other Mandeli were either in Bombay, Lonavala, or Pune. Behramji had been sent to Persia, and Begul was still in Persia, conducting a school financed by Dolat Mai in Meher Baba's name. During <clears throat> this one week of silence, Baba saw, saw no one except Padri, Gustaji, and Masaji were ordered to stay on the property, but to keep, to keep aloof from him. Rustam came daily from Ahmad Nagar with the newspaper and the mail. Sidebar says Vishnu visited for the day on the 19th of November. Mm -hmm. If the need arose, Baba wrote small notes giving instructions about daily activities in Gujarati to Padri and slept them through the window. Padri would likewise write his replies and slip them inside. On Friday, 21st November 1924, Baba wrote to Padri in Gujarati. Due to my weak health and great strain of the working since yesterday, a lot of vital fluid is flown by and a great weakness has overcome me. Still, there is nothing to worry about. On the seventh day, like on Monday, we will know what the situation is regarding my health. If this condition continues, then perhaps 
the working will have to be discontinued. If my health does not give more trouble, then the court, like universal work, will proceed further. This will happen according to the orders of the old ones, perfect masters. It is, it is to be seen also what explosive message arrives. If coming out of seclusion happens, I am thinking of going to Mahalabeshwar to improve my health. To eat once in two days is not difficult, but weakness is making the work difficult. Do not be frightened. After two or three days, <clears throat> we will see. <clears throat> the next day, Baba wrote, because of fever, extreme weakness has set in. During the first week of December, 1924, after his one week seclusion and silence, Baba left Merabad for Bombay by train with Padre Masaji Gustaji, Mehra Dolad Mai, Naja, and a small horseship. He again rented the quarters at the Furucha building where he had stayed during January 1924 before his trip to Persia. Before the train left Ahmed Nagar station, Baba called Mehera to his compartment and told her to massage his feet. She began doing so and he suddenly said to her, if you press my feet like this every day, I will make you like Baba Jean. But after this, during this, their stay in the Brusha building, there was no possibility of massaging Baba's feet since he would often be fasting in seclusion and no one but Bustaji was allowed to go near him. Thank you, Mahu. During the month of December, Baba would occasionally eat in Barucha, building but for the most part or remained on liquids, usually warm water mixed with sugar. During this period, Baba also ordered Gustaji to fast for a week on water only. Naja, with Mehra's help, cooked the meals in Bombay. Kurshet was staying with her parents at Irani Mansion. As they cooked, Kustaji occasionally went to the kitchen and expounded on the ways of the master. Once while Gustaji was relating an amusing anecdote, Naja loud, laughed loudly. Baba overheard her and angrily ordered Masaji to take his daughter back to Pune. They left immediately to the train station for the train station. After a short while, Baba ordered Mehra too to leave the house and told Daulat Mai to go upstairs to her room. Mehra was wearing an ordinary household sari and did not know where she was supposed to go. She also had orders not to let any man touch her. And on the sidewalk, some pedestrians were jostling past each other on the street. However, Mehra left and began slowly walking along, not knowing where she was headed. In a short time, Baba came walking towards her with Gustaji. He walked past her 
to Burjur Dahiwala's house next to Manzile Neen and Mera followed them. Baba then instructed Gustadji to take Mera back to their residence. Meanwhile, Naja and Masaji had missed the train to Pune and went to the Hiwala's home also, where Baba encountered them, embracing Naja, who was in tears. Baba explained to her that she was not to blame, that he was upset due to another reason. Naja related that Baba also had tears in his eyes. Baba led Naja and Masaji back to Bharucha building where he explained, why did I get upset with Naja? Because of my work at that moment? It was absolutely necessary that you all not remain in the house. For this reason, I pretended to be upset and ordered all to leave. Turning to Naja, he reassured her that she was not to blame and should not, shouldn't worry about disturbing him. The next day, Baba told Mehra, Naja, and Daulat Mai, you should never leave me. Even if I force you away, you should always hold on to me. Throughout the 1920s, while traveling, between Ahmednagar and Bombay, Baba would often stop in Pune to visit his family. While he was staying at the Barucha building also, he brought the group to Pune for a few days. During this period, he began calling his younger brother, Adi Jr. In order to distinguish between him and Adi K. Rani, whom he called Adi Sr. Adi Jr. had a mischievous, carefree side like his brothers, Jamshed and Jalbai. One day, while Baba was visiting the family, Adi pinched some chewing tobacco from Baba's box, snuck away and chewed it. He promptly became dizzy and nauseated. Memo found out what he had done and told Baba. Baba gave him a hard slap and scolded. Why did you snitch my tobacco? Adi countered. Why not? You chew tobacco? Good girl. Don't do as I do. Baba warned him. I can't I can fast for months on an on end, can you? Do as I tell you to do. Don't ever try to imitate me in any way. Shortly thereafter, Baba gave his younger brother a pinch of tobacco. Adi expressed his confusion. I don't understand. You slap me for chewing tobacco? And now you're giving it to me? Baba said, I'm giving it to you. So now it is all right. Then he winked, joked. Just don't tell Memo. And this time, Adi did not feel dizzy or ill. Hmm. Adi Jr. was also spiritually inclined. Just a minute. Is it okay if... Everybody mutes themselves because I'm hearing some kind of an echo. Rosalie, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Adi Jr. was also spiritually inclined. Adi had met Upasani Maharaj in Sakori with his mother and admired the great yogi's awesome personality. During this period, Adi was attending St. Vincent's High School and became captivated with Hazrat Babajan. In fact, he was so fascinated with the ancient woman that at this time he had a higher re regard for her than for his own brother. Unbeknown to his father or mother, almost every day on his way from school, Adi would stop 
by her seat under the neem tree in char bawdi he would stand near her and gaze at her sometimes baba jaan would beckon him to have a cup of tea with her but she would not speak in telegraphy around him and would not mention mehran or ask adi anything about himself it was observed that the language baba jaan uttered was something which was virtually incomprehensible her language was distinctly her own but she would usually mutter something in different languages or enigmatic sounds which no one could follow however one day for no apparent reason she gazed deeply into adi's eyes and spoke in clear persian speak the truth no matter how bitter it may be adi was startled by her words they made a great impact on him and he never forgot them he never heard baba jaan speak intelligibly again while baba was staying at barucha building a devotee named dhunji shaw would come daily with a large packet of incense sticks he would light the entire packet and wave the sticks in front of baba's face in a gesture of reverence this was annoying and troublesome for baba and the mandali told the man to stop doing it but dhunji shaw ignored them saying you people don't know who baba is if he wishes he can turn the whole world upside down to avoid dhunji shaw's daily ritual whenever anyone saw him coming they would quickly warn baba who would lay down and pretend to be sleeping the ploy worked for a while but dhunji shaw began waiting until baba woke from his nap dina thalati sona masi and small kurshed would often come to the barucha building and occasionally baba would let them accompany the other women on walks that he led throughout the city at one point he took them to victoria gardens every day for a week he would move about rapidly doing his inner work telling the ladies to have a casual look around the gardens one day he showed them the bench where as mehran he used to sit during the period in 1916 of the coming down to normal human consciousness it was a place where a parsi had misconstrued his particular peculiar behavior and had slapped him for staring at his daughter baba narrated the incident to the women laughing about how humorous it seemed now It was also during this period at the end of 1924 that from Rose Dad Dada Chanji began visiting the master regularly and established a close link One evening Baba told Chanji to take the women to a movie at Madeleine Cinema which Chanji owned Dalat Mai Mehra and Naja were able to leave dressed in these in their ordinary saris when baba told them have you all turned into nuns do clothes have any connection with spirituality no change your clothes and then let's go the ladies were happy to put on their finest saris and go with baba to the movies However, after watching only half an hour of the film, Baba unexpectedly wanted to leave, and they returned to the Barucha building. Shanji, as he was nicknamed, was ordered by Baba to sell his cinema, and after relieving himself of all worldly responsibilities and attachments, to come and stay permanently as one of the resident mandali. There were many ants in Barucha building. Once Mera made weak tea for Baba without milk and sent it to him. 
He found an ant in the cup and became annoyed. Later explaining to her about being most particular when serving him. Mehra quickly learned how careful one should be when offering anything to the master. On another occasion, Baba suddenly felt hungry and Naja and Mehra hastened to prepare something for him to eat. That day, many visitors had come to see the master and he would ask each, have you had your food? Each person would reply affirmatively. Baba would then state, you are lucky to have eaten. Just look at my feet. I'm hungry. But see how my women disciples care for me. Meher Dawala, would you like to read next? Yeah, thank you. Lovely story read. Very nice. Uh, journey. Hmm? While Naja and Mehra hurried to cook his lunch. Oh, sorry. This one. This one. Okay. okay. Lunch. Baba would send messages to them saying, such and such has come and has eaten but I am starving and no one cares about feeding me. Baba kept sending them this message every other minute until the food was ready. Hence, the women mandali too was spared from Baba's arrows. Baba again observed silence for a week in the Bharuta building, ordering no one to enter the room, Gustavji and keeping watch would hand him a glass of warm water, a warm sugar water once every 24 hours. Thus, Mer Baba had now kept silence four times at Igatpuri in October 1923, twice in the Jopri at Merabad during May and November 1924, and now in Bombay. One night in December, a Kawali program was being held outside the house. Baba listened to the singing the whole night from inside his room. Baba's memories and a vocal skill were acute that the next day he sang the same Kawalis. In the entirely to the women afterwards, he declared in a melodious voice, one should get so drowned in the love of the divine beloved that one is unaware of anything else. There is no rule underlying this path except for the lover to consider the divine beloved's pleasure as his own. In December 1924, Baba travels southward to Belgam with his uncle Masaji. After seemingly aimless wandering through the town, they returned to Bombay. Baba's travel was never without some spiritual purpose at times. He would travel hundreds of miles on a train only to return from that very station to his place of starting. Without ever leaving the station at other times, he would achieve his spiritual work by simply setting foot in a particular place for a while, a few minutes. His work on the inner planes was something quite distinct. The universal work done <clears throat> on the inner planes was invisible and impossible to gorge on a physical level. For instance, a spiritual agent was appointed to look after the affairs of an entire city, communicating with his agent and instructing him regarding the population of the city, whether visibly or invisibly done. Obviated, the necessity of the master 
having the contact every person individually there it was difficult to imagine <clears throat> the real purpose for mer baba's travels and his constant sudden changes of plan <clears throat> to understand the work of unlimited one must become unlimited thank you mikhail would you like to read next on 11 january 1925 baba wrote to gani since the last 9 days i am again sustain sustaining on pure water and though a bit weak am healthy and energetic thank god after staying 2 months in the barucha building on 25th january at his birth no baba returned to merabad with everyone and an entirely new phase of mer baba's activities began so now we are in 1925 chapter 5 the silence begins as soon as baba returned to merabad he announced his intention to enter the jopti for a few days with padri on watch outside he wrote to ramju and gani sorry i could not let you know earlier of padri being unable to come to you because i am entering the room tomorrow to remain locked there through 1st february god willing and padri will stay outside the room don't lose heart in any matter but with a free mind and a brave heart go on with your work i'll meet you chaps in february and talk over things if i come out alive merwan after his return to ahmed naga baba began to refer to merabad as his permanent headquarters where he would now hold public darshan many people of all castes and creeds began to come regularly for his darshan not only from arangaon and ahmed naga but distant places as well all the men mandali returned to live at merabad including pendu the arangaon children were especially happy for they had missed baba with his presence there they were now assured of his entertaining company as well as his having good treats to eat once baba asked the children can you all come tomorrow afternoon one replied we cannot come because we have to get graze the goats if we don't our parents will beat us can, can you put the page up please all right Baba told them to tell their parents that he invited them to come if they permitted. The next day, 30 children from Arangaon came to Merabad and Baba bathed each one, dressed them in new clothes and gave them sweets. The poor villagers came to know of this and soon men, women and more children came and requested clothing. Baba told them to be patient. A short time passed and one day he distributed clothes among all in the village and served a feast. After a while, as the number of children increased, it was proposed that a school be opened for them. In February 1925, Baba sent Dalatme, Mera and Naja to Sakori for a few days. When they arrived, Upasni Maharaj asked Mera where she was now staying and mera replied with mera baba one of upasni maharaj's main women disciples at the time duga bai karam karmakal karmakal was Karmarkar. very fond can you say that karmakal was... thank you was very fond of mera and urged her to remain in sakori after some days passed Baba sent Masaji to Sakori with a letter addressed to Mera stating if you wish to stay in Sakori you may but I will be happy if you return to Merabad
when the three women told Maharaj of their decision to leave, he sharply said in the presence of others gathered there, what is this? Has this lad Mera now become a saint? What does he know of spirituality? What have you gained from his hands? If you wish to jump into the ditch, I won't stop you. Leave me and go to him if you insist. But after a while, Maharaj called the three women back for a private meeting with him and then lovingly said, you should leave here and go to Merwan. Stay with him. Merwan is mine and I am his. Hold firmly to his feet. After many years, the world will come to know who Merwan really is. The next day, Daulat May, Mera and Najar returned to Merabad, accompanied by Masaji. Baba's 31st birthday was celebrated on 18th February, 1925 at Maribad. A huge pavilion was erected over the post office veranda and elaborately decorated. Hundreds assembled for his darshan. His parents, Bobo and Memo, had arrived a few days before with his brothers, Behram and Adi, and sister Mani. All of the master's close followers from Bombay, Pune, and Ahmednagar also arrived prior to the celebration. Mera, Daulat May, Naja, Daula Masi, Jamshed's wife, Big Korshed, Suna Masi, and Small Korshed were already staying in the post office building, which was now established as a permanent residential quarter for the women Mandali. For the men Mandali, temporary quarters of tin sheds were improvised on the other side of the grounds. A storeroom was built on the post office veranda and Gustaji was appointed to manage it. During this public celebration, a great feast was served in which hundreds of people happily participated. There was singing of bhajans and kirtans throughout the day and everyone had Baba's darshan. The visitors departed with two days, within two days after the birthday and the regime of work has resumed by the Mandali, was resumed by the Mandali. Once during the festivities, all the guests were seated on the veranda of the post office. The man on one side and the woman on the other. Naja happened to smile slightly as she crossed the veranda to sit with the other woman. Baba had been watching her and became furious. He called her and slapping her soundly, he scolded. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Why are you laughing like a mad woman in front of everyone? I don't like women laughing in front of men. Whatever they want to do outside is their business, but not in my presence. Some of the women guests had been laughing among themselves and they silently witnessed the scene. Thus, Baba taught them a lesson they would never forget, although it meant inflicting an unjustified and humiliating punishment for Onyang Naja. The master always kept the men and women's quarters separate in the ashram. He would retire inside his jokti at Lower Marabad with the men sleeping nearby, while the women slept in the post office building across the road near the railroad tracks. He would visit the women daily and sit on an empty crate of brook bond tea on the veranda of the post office, seldom ever going into their room. Thank you, Rene, are you there? Right. Marvin, do you want to go next or should we stop recording you? Sorry, I'm still attending to Franey, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Why don't we read at least uh, one or two pages and then we can stop, okay? Why don't you go ahead, Marvin? Thank you. The silence begins. Surrounded by his women disciples, he would relax and sing bhajans with them or request that they tell him humorous stories. Umai's daughters, Paroja and Dali, would come to visit with their mother and Dali was later to join the women at Meribad. An interesting incident once occurred between Mera and Upazi Maharaj. Before Mera settled in Meher Baba's ashram, she had lived for some time in Maharaja's ashram at Sakori. 
One day in 1922, a Brahmin woman visited Sukhori and presented a plain gold ring to the master. Maharaj did not want it and told the lady, I wear only gunny sacks. No clothes adorn my body. How will this golden ring beautify me, an ugly old man? However, the lady was so insistent that Maharaj told her to put it on his toe. Later, Upazi Maharaj's devotees were sure the master would give the ring to one of his women disciples, and each was naturally wishing that she would be the recipient. As the ladies of the ashram took Maharaj's darshan, hoping in their hearts the master would present the ring to them, he gave the ring to Mera, telling her, wear this ring and be careful not to lose it. She wore it from that day on for the rest of her life. One day in 1925, accompanied by Gustaji, Baba came to the post office veranda and taking a seat on the wooden tea crate, sent word to the women that whosoever possessed a ring should send it to him through Gustaji. Gustaji approached Mera, but she was unable to remove the ring that Upasi Maharaj had given her from her finger. Big Korshid was wearing a wedding ring, but she did not wish to part with and refused to give it to Gustaji. With great difficulty, Mera was finally able to extract the ring and handed it to Gustaji. Soon after, Baba brought back the ring that Maharaj had given to Mera and presented her with another heart-shaped gold ring on which was engraved one word, Meher. Baba put both rings around one of the fingers of her left hand and told her never to take them off. The pure one's faith was sealed. Age declared, Meher was carved forever on Mera's heart. Mera was destined to become the master's chief woman disciple. One day on the post office veranda, Baba told her the story of Radha and Krishna and said, as Krishna's love was for Radha, so is my love for you. You love me as Radha loved Krishna. A few days later, Baba declared before all the women Mandali, Mehra is my Radha. Her love is unique. She is most special to me. Over the years, many times Baba referred to Mehra as the purest soul in the universe and the one who loved him most. As Baba said, Mera's unique position in his circle is the same as Sita's was to Lord Ram, as Radha's was to Krishna, or as Mary Magdalene's was to Jesus. All four sides of the post office were, world, were walled off by bamboo screens, making an improvised compound so the women could live in strict privacy. Not one of them was allowed to step out of this boundary, and no other men except Baba and Gustaji could enter the premises. During this period at Meribad, Baba would for some days remain aloof from the public fasting and seclusion. He would fast on either water or weak milkless tea. Meanwhile, the number of Aaron Gown children increased day by day and a one room schoolroom was started. Arrangements to provide a boarding house for students were also in progress at Meribad. At this time, Dala Masi had to leave for Pune because Baba's elder brother, Jamshed, had fallen seriously ill. Dalamasi had been overseeing the cooking and Baba informed the other women, if you are willing to cook for over 100 people every day, then remain here. Otherwise you should go away. Except for Naja and Dalamai, none of them knew how to cook. Mera and small Karshed urged Naja to stay and offered to help her. Naja agreed to take over Dalamasi's responsibility which pleased Baba. Only a few children from Aragon were residing at Meribat, but the number of men Mandali living there had grown. The food would be cooked in enormous pots to handle the number of people. Baba forbade the waste of food, and if he found that there was any left over, Naja would be blamed. During this period, a Maratha woman in her late 20s named Walu Bao Pawar 25, was intensely joined to the master. And the footnote here says, Walu's name is sometimes spelled as Balu, would it be? Soon after meeting Meher Baba, she surrendered to his spiritual guidance, dedicating all her possessions and property to him. 
Walu resided in Arangam, but she was allowed to come daily and be with the women monthly at the post office quarters. She was assigned the duty of baking bakri and would also assist Mera in attending to Baba's personal needs. Okay, I think we should hold it there for today. So we're up to page 569, and we'll stop the screen share and the recording. That was very lovely. Thank you. Yeah, it was really nice.